Yeah, so I'll just go ahead and get started. So um, as this audience probably knows, uh, our brains are capable of amazing things, right? And um, our sensory circuits are organized for efficient processing. So uh, I had to put in a hockey slide since I'm presenting in Canada, technically. Um, so these gold medal uh, Olympians are capable of doing incredible things at very fast rates, right? So this hockey player has to take into account where her body is in space, where her opponent is, where the puck is, and sort of uh, take all this information in seamlessly in order to navigate and do successful things like score goals and win gold medals. Uh, of course, this isn't limited to uh, elite athletes. We do this every day as we navigate the world. You know, every time you cross an intersection, you have to take in a lot of information pretty quickly in order to get across safely. Uh, and so the way that I think about um, these sensory circuits is there's two main things that we need to extract from the, the world in order to navigate correctly and, and do appropriate behaviors. And so that is we need to extract spatial relationships. So that is where things are in space. And we also need to uh, extract qualitative information. So that is what things are. So if you're gonna cross this street, you need to know uh, if it's a bike or a bus that's coming to you from the right or the left, and that will dictate your behavior, right? And so my lab uh, is really interested in understanding how circuits are uh, organized to detect these and how, what are the developmental mechanisms by which this precise work, uh, excuse me, precise uh, circuit wiring uh, is established. And this is an important problem, um, not just from a fundamental perspective, but um, sensory processing deficits are, are actually very common in a lot of neurodevelopmental disorders. So uh, across a bunch of different disorders, this is one common um, thread. And so as many as one in 20 kids can experience uh, sensory processing deficits, um, the real uh, problem seems to be that it can amplify behavioral problems and interfere with therapy. So if you talk with occupational therapists that work with neurodevelopmental, kids with neurodevelopmental disorders, the first thing they tell you is you gotta get them in a sensory environment where they're not overstimulated or understimulated so that they can actually respond to things. Um, unfortunately though, we're, this is, while it's a well appreciated problem, the neural correlates of sensory processing deficits in a lot of these disorders are pretty poorly understood and kind of diverse. So for example, let's take a look at Fragile X syndrome, which I'll talk about some of the work that our lab has done with Fragile X syndrome. And uh, individuals with Fragile X um, present sensory processing deficits in multiple domains. So the visual, somatosensory and auditory domains. And there's been a lot of work to uncover what are the underlying you know, neurological connectivity problems and functional problems. And they are, you know, there are some common things to all domains, but there are also individual things to each domain. So there's a lot of work to be done to figure out what is going on basically in these um, model organisms. And so our lab um, is really interested in understanding how sort of sensory information comes together in the brain and how those circuits develop. And to uh, address that very complicated question, we focus on a, a structure in the midbrain called the superior colliculus, which is a midbrain structure that uh, regulates reflexive sort of head and eye movements, although it actually does even more complex behaviors uh, we're, we're noticing here. And so interestingly, the SC is a multi-sensory structure. And so it uh, process, in the mouse, at least, it processes visual information, somatosensory information, and auditory information, and then uh, sends information out to drive motor behavioral responses. And within each of these uh, layers of the SC, information is organized what we call topographically. And I'll get into that in the next slide a little bit. And what you find in this SC is sort of that the, these uh, maps of space in these different uh, sensory domains, so the visual, somatosensory, and auditory domain, are all aligned with one another. So that different regions of the SC, if you were to take a, an electrode and send it straight down the SC here, you would find that they would respond to similar regions of space. And then at the bottom of this, there's a motor map that's also topographically um, organized so that you sort of, if you get a sensory stimulus over here, you respond appropriately and, and orient yourself 
And so uh, the question that I'm going to talk about today, which our lab has long been interested in, is sort of how is map alignment achieved in the in the colliculus? And we'll focus today just on the visual system uh, because it actually has converging inputs in the SC and is uh, where we've made the most sort of advances, I guess, in understanding this. Okay, so here's a skim, sim, me, simple schematic of uh, the visual system of a mouse, uh, or at least the image forming uh, centers in the mouse. Uh, so vision, as you guys know, starts in the retina uh, in the eye, and different regions of your retina are actually looking at different regions of visual space based on where they are in the retina. And when uh, retinal ganglion cells, which are the output cells of the eye, project into the brain, they do so, uh, they target um, two main image forming areas, the dorsal lateral geniculate, or DLGN, in the thalamus, and the superior colliculus, or SC, as I'll probably call it a lot throughout this talk, in the midbrain. Uh, when these retinal ganglion cells project to these areas, they do so topographically, such that the neighbor-neighbor relationships in the eye are maintained in their terminal targets. Uh, in the LGN and the SC. And so in this way, you get a very efficient relay of the um, spatial information uh, in the outside world. Uh, information processing doesn't stop at these state at these places. So in the DLGN, neurons process and relay information to the primary visual cortex, again, maintaining this topographic order. And in V1, this is the beginning of sort of conscious visual processing. Information gets distributed to a lot of places uh, throughout the cortex, uh, to other motor areas, et cetera. And one place that V1 sends information is actually back to the SC. And these neurons project from layer five and they terminate in the SC such that they're in alignment with retinal ganglion cells that are looking at the same region of space. And a big, the big question we have been asking is sort of how do these neurons know where to go and who to synapse with uh, in the SC? Uh, I should say that this uh, development of this, these uh, projections occurs in sort of a stepwise manner in the SC. So these retinal ganglion cell projections actually develop first. So if you do a tracing experiment where you put a small amount of dye I in the retina, you can follow those axons and look at what we call a termination zone in the SC. And if you do this over development, what you find is that over the first postnatal week, these uh, ganglion cells, if you look at P1, postnatal day one, um, the, the axons are sort of streaming over everywhere. And then over the next week or so, they sort of refine, prune away the ones that are inappropriate and finalize and, and consolidate a single termination zone that's in a topographically appropriate position. Uh, following this, actually, if you look in, uh, if you trace these uh, visual cortical projections, they actually come in a little bit later. So we don't start seeing uh, innervation of the SC by these neurons until about P6. But then over the next uh, week or so, they go through a similar process where they sort of have these exuberant branches and then slowly prune away the ones that aren't appropriate until they are in a final topographically appropriate position that is aligned with this, this retinal map. And so the question we've been asking is sort of how, how do you do this? And when we first started thinking about this, we thought there were two you know, general models by which this could happen. And so we know that retinocollicular projections, uh, the topography is reg regulated a lot by molecular cues, specifically these families of F, what are called EPH or F as I'll call them, uh, and their ligands, the efferents. Uh, and so one could imagine that you could simply use a, what we call the gradient matching model. So you could have uh, gradients of sa the same molecules uh, in V1 read the same gradient in the SC and thus get this sort of de facto alignment uh, in the SC. And indeed, uh, we know that these FA and FNA molecules are expressed in gradients in V1 uh, all throughout the layers. And so they are sort of in the right place um, to do this. The other model we thought of was that you can imagine that because of the timing of these two different steps, since retinal neurons are there first, they could provide some sort of instructive cue to the later arriving V1 neurons. And I'll get to this in a second, but this could be through molecular cues or through an activity dependent mechanism. And so the, the evidence that we have gathered over the last couple, we and others, I should say, uh, Michael's lab has actually done a lot of great work on this as well, sort of suggests that these retinal inputs are 
doing a lot of the instructive uh, information for these V1 neurons that are um, uh, arriving later. And so I'll do a brief review of, of some of the most compelling evidence, I guess, in, in favor of that. And this is uh, derived from using a, a very interesting mouse model uh, that was developed uh, 20 years ago now, which seems crazy, uh, in Greg Lemke's lab. And so this is a so-called islet 2 fa 3 knock-in mouse model. And so what uh, Arthur Brown did when he was in the lab is he uh, knocked in the fa 3 receptor tyrosine kinase uh, into the islet 2 locus. Okay, so why does that matter? So islet 2 it turns out, is a transcription factor, originally identified in the pancreas, later in spinal motor neurons, and it turns out also expressed by retinal ganglion cells. So here's a in situ hybridization for islet 2 in the retina. And it turns out it's expressed in about 40 to 50% of all retinal ganglion cells. And FA3 is one of these receptor tyrosine kinases that uh, it is in a family of molecules that regulates topographic mapping. However, FA3 itself is not actually expressed by retinal ganglion cells normally. But in this um, mutant mouse, now you have a situation where all of the islet 2 positive neurons are now expressing, expressing FA3 at very high levels. And so what happens as a result, I won't belabor you with the details, but instead of establishing a single uh, topographic map uh, in the SC, here uh, wild type showing you tracings uh, from say the, the post, the, sorry, the nasal to the posterior and the temporal to the anterior, what you get is a duplication of the map. So for each single injection of DII, you get two termination zones in the SC of these mutant FA3 knock-in mice. Uh, and they are topographically organized as well. So here they did side-by-side -side red and green labeled injections. And you see that this red and green are next to one another. Okay, so you can look at this um, functionally as well. So when I was a postdoc, we collaborated with Mike Stryker's lab to do uh, intrinsic signal optical imaging which is uh, a somewhat complicated technique, but uh, I'll try to summarize here. So basically what you can do is you can shine red light onto the surface of the brain and monitor changes in red light reflectance in response to a repetitive uh, stimulus. And that change in red light reflectance is a proxy for changes in blood oxygenation, which is a proxy for changes in neuronal activity. So it's kind of like an MRI-ish type thing. And so what we did is we showed mice um, a vertical bar drifting left to right, sort of over and over and over again. And what you can do is you can extract regions of the SC that were active when the bar was on the left, and here we've colored those green. When the bar was in the middle, uh, active neurons are colored blue, and when the bar is on the right, we color those red. So you get this smooth progression of activity as the bar moves across the screen in the SC. And when we did this experiment in the FA3 knock-in mice, we get this really striking result where the map is duplicated functionally as well. So you go green to blue to red and green to blue to red again. Uh, so this was really cool and sort of suggested that this duplication uh, results in functional stuff, uh, functional duplication as well. Uh, so we, in these mice, could also look uh, in the visual cortex of these mice and to our surprise, somewhat, we found that there was no duplication here. So you go green, blue, red, and green, blue, red in both the wild type and the mutant. And what this allowed us to do was ask, what happens to these V1 neurons when they project to an SC, which is normally singular and is now duplicated, right? And it allowed us to distinguish between these gradient matching and retinal instruction models. Because if gradient matching were used, then a single injection in the SC should still go to a single place in, or, sorry, a single injection in V1 should still go to a single place in the SC. But if it's um, sort of uh, instructional, then a single injection, say in the blue area, should give you two terminals in the blue area of the SC of these mutants. And in fact, that's what we found. So each and every time we traced uh, projections from V1 to the SC in these mutant mice, we found two termination zones instead of the one that we would find in a normal mouse. Uh, and so now the question is, okay, this really supports the idea that retinal inputs are sort of shaping the way that these V1 neurons are, are establishing their connectivity in the SC. And the question is, how do they do that? 
And so we think that there's probably two ways you can imagine this happens, right? You could imagine a molecular mechanism where, for instance, retinal neurons that come in first are expressing uh, some sort of cue on their axonal terminal, or you could imagine that they induce the expression of some cue on the SC neuron that then is read by the later arriving V1 neurons. And in this way, you sort of make sure that you match up neurons that are looking at the right region in space. And there's a, a evidence for this actually from Michael Reber's lab and Elise is actually on the call who did some really excellent work looking at um, a, a model similar to that islet 2 FA3 knock-in where they knocked in Efrin A3 and found uh, that neurons make the subtle changes in their projection, V1 neurons make subtle changes in their projections. But I won't belabor you with the, the details again. The other model is you could imagine that things are done in an activity matching way. So that is neurons in the, the retina uh, that are looking at a certain region of space would have um, a certain pattern of activity. Uh, and neurons in V1 that are looking at that same place would have the same pattern of, of activity and you could coalesce those inputs onto an SC neuron that, that has the same activity. And so what I'm gonna to discuss today is our work that really suggests that activity matching plays in a very important role in the establishment of uh, uh, map alignment, perhaps in combination with these molecular matching strategies that uh, the Reber lab has, has uncovered. We had sort of established that these retinal inputs are instructing these V1 neurons where to go in the SC. And the question is, how do they do that? And uh, we're gonna talk about this activity matching um, hypothesis and uh, how we've gone about sort of uh, trying to get after that. Okay, so in the developing nervous system, there's actually multiple sources of neuronal activity that sort of change over development. So embryonically, uh, there are these waves of activity that start in the retina that are propagated throughout the visual system um, uh, that are mediated by gap junctions. So we call those electrical waves. And then after birth, uh, for the first like eight to 10 days of life, um, these waves of activity, and I'll, I'll show you an example of them, are uh, mediated by cholinergic signaling. And then after that, there's a switch to glutamatergic signaling. Uh, and then eventually the eyes open in the mouse around P14 or P15. Uh, and you have the beginning of a visually evoked activity in the visual system. Uh, and so based on the timing of the uh, development of these retinal, or sorry, visual cortical inputs coming into the SC, we focus on these cholinergic waves. So what do I mean by these? So uh, here we're looking at uh, top down on the SC uh, of a mouse, both hemispheres of the SC. Uh, and what, uh, Timothy Burbridge uh, from the Cray Lab did here is he loaded the SC with calcium indicators. And what you're gonna see is these regions of activity in the SC that propagate around the SC um, in these wave-like fashion. So local, um, closely uh, neighboring neurons are gonna be active at the same time, and then that wave will move on to another region. And a lot of work has been done actually um, looking at mutants in which the, uh, uh, a subunit of the, the choline, nicotinic acetylcholine receptor has been mutated and, and the wave activity in these mice is, is severely disrupted. So there's still activity, but the, the uh, spatial temporal patterns and structure of it are, are totally messed up. And it turns out that uh, these waves, if you disrupt these waves, you disrupt um, topographic mapping in the SC. So uh, both in the retinocollicular projection and we showed in this cortical collicular projection, you have disruption, uh, sort of a broadening, a failure of this refinement basically to happen uh, in the SC. We went on to show in this paper that actually if you cross this mutant into that islet 2 fa 3 knock-in mutant that has a duplicated map, that the, the retinal map remains duplicated, but these V1 neurons fail to align with that duplicated retinal map. So that is a strong indicator that this neuronal activity may be playing an important role in establishing alignment of these V1 neurons. And so now the question that we've been trying to ask in the lab is sort of how does activity drive map alignment? What are the, the mechanisms downstream? And what I'll uh, tell you about today are two stories, one unpublished and one published and partially unpublished, um, looking at candidate molecules uh, 
that we think might be involved in activity dependent map alignment. And the first story is looking at NMDA receptors uh, and their role in, in the establishment of this alignment. And then FMRP, which is the protein mutated and or um, silenced in, in fragile X syndrome. And our preliminary data suggests that it plays a, a role in later events like consolidation and maintenance of alignment. Okay, so uh, these NMDA receptors, uh, which you guys are probably very familiar with, are ideal candidates to mediate this activity dependent alignment. And so the idea here is that um, uh, it, based on Hebb's postulate, which is that neurons that fire together wire together. So that is at a, um, a synapse, if neuron A and neuron B are firing in a similar pattern, this will um, activate a cascade of events that leads to the strengthening of the synapse uh, over time. Whereas if the, the, the neurons are not firing in the same pattern, that leads to weakening and eventually removal of the synapse. And so you can imagine how this can happen between two neurons, and it can also happen between multiple neurons. So if you have neighboring neurons that are converging onto a single cell that have similar firing patterns, then those, uh, the, the synaptic contacts of both of those neurons would be strengthened, whereas those that are uh, not firing in the same pattern would be removed. And so you can imagine that converging retinal and collicular inputs that are firing in the same pattern, that's how you might get uh, uh, alignment of these cortical inputs. And these NMDA receptors are, are uh, we think, ideal candidates because they have this unique feature where they are activated by neuronal depolarization. So that is to say, in the resting state, there's this magnesium ion that sits in the middle of the NMDA channel and prevents the uh, influx of calcium and sodium through the, the NMDA receptor, uh, even though glutamate might be bound. However, uh, if the neuron uh, is in a depolarized state, then this magnesium ion gets kicked out, and then now this uh, channel can be activated by, by glutamate. And so this has made them um, known as sort of coincidence detectors. Uh, and in fact, these NMDA receptors have been shown to play a role in topographic mapping previously. Uh, so here's a study actually from many, many years ago uh, in, in the rat where uh, uh, in the, the, I think this was in the Constantine Patent Lab, uh, they uh, traced projections from the, the retina to the SC. And so here we're looking sort of in sagittal section, you can see a nice tight termination zone. But if you apply uh, NMDA blockers like MK801 or AP5 to the surface of the SC during development, then you get a disruption of this topographic order. So you get these exuberant branches uh, into the uh, other regions of the SC. And uh, studies in uh, uh, zebrafish, or no, yeah, frogs have shown uh, similar uh, properties if you look at an individual neuron level. So if you block or overactivate NMDA receptors, you get a disruption in the, um, temp the dynamics and branching patterns of retinal ganglion cells as they enter the tectum, which is the uh, fish and frog equivalent of the SC. And in fact, the Ruth Hazer lab uh, recently showed that there uh, are, are distinct roles for both pre and postsynaptic NMDA receptors uh, in regulating the branching, uh, connectivity and function of neurons uh, in the between the, the retina and the SC. Okay, so, so NMDA receptors do the right thing. They are in the right place and they have, have been shown to be involved in topographic mapping. So we wanted to test their role in map alignment. But we were sort of faced with a problem here, right? So I previously showed you that retinal inputs are instructing these V1 neurons where to go. And if NMDA receptors are important for retinocollicular mapping, if we disrupt them the entire time, we won't be able to tell if uh, if we see a disruption in V1 projections, if it's due to the NMDA receptors or the disrupted retinal map. And so we thought about this a lot and we came up with a strategy uh, that leverages the difference in timing of these two events. So retinal collicular mapping happens during the first postnatal week, whereas this V1 mapping occurs in the second postnatal week. So what we wanted to do was manipulate NMDA receptor function uh, in the SC in a temporally specific manner. And so to do that, we needed to make a tool <laughs> to allow us to do that. Uh, and so we uh, identified this molecule, actually uh, searched the literature and, and previous people had uh, made lines that uh, 
uh, marked this population of neurons expressing TAL1, which is a transcription factor that plays a really important role in uh, hematopoiesis and um, endothelial cell uh, differentiation. It turns out that it is also expressed in the brain and really specifically in the superior colliculus, uh, especially superficial layers where uh, all of the events that we are interested in, in uh, investigating occur. Uh, and so what we did is we uh, made a, a new mouse model where we knocked in a um, tamoxifen inducible version of Cree to the three prime untranslated region of the tau one locus. And so this allowed us now to uh, hopefully manipulate gene expression in the SC in a temporally uh, specific way. And so in fact, uh, if we made these mice and if we cross them to a TD tomato reporter mouse, we can show that they mark uh, uh, neurons uh, in the SC uh, and throughout the midbrain, but they do not, uh, and so here's a closer up view of SC expression uh, in the TD tomato reporter mice. Importantly, they do not express in the retina, nor do they um, label neurons in, in V1. And uh, we show that we can have temporal control, so we can uh, inject tamoxifen at different times in development and look a few days later and find that we we have this ability to give tamoxifen, you know, early on at P0 or P5 or P10, all the way out to P30, and we can still label uh, neurons in the SC. Uh, so this is really nice and powerful tool that, that's going to allow us to ask our question. Okay, and so the idea here is that we're going to cross these tau one mice with mice that are floxed for the, the NR1 or GRIN1 allele, which is the obligate subunit of the NMDA receptor. And so we're gonna look at these combination mutant mice in which we inject tamoxifen. So the first thing we wanted to do was verify that we could do this. So the, the experiment strategy is that we're gonna let uh, retinocollicular map uh, develop normally up to P6 or so, and then we'll start injecting tamoxifen daily from P6 to P8. And then we wanted to look at NM, NR1 uh, expression. Uh, by qPCR. And so we have a probe that looks in this flux region. And uh, to our delight, we are able to knock down uh, NR1 expression uh, in the SC. And importantly, we do not knock it down in other regions like B1 um, or the retina in these mice. Okay, so now we have a tool and we can ask our question. So now the experiment is we're going to give tamoxifen and then we'll inject DII around P10 and then look at P12 when the, when the visual cortical map is mature. Uh, or actually look in the retina first, because it's important we want to make sure we don't mess up retinal collicular topography. And so that was the first experiment we did. Here we're tracing from the retina to the SC. This is what a control mouse looks like. This is what a mutant mouse looks like. And you can see that we see no difference in the topographic um, order or size of the termination zones uh, in the S SC of these mice. So this is for the retinocollicular projection. And then we do the same experiment but now tracing these V1 to SC projections. And so in a control mouse, we get termination zones that look like this, but in a, a mutant mouse, now we see an enlargement of these uh, termination zones, suggesting that these NMDA receptors are playing an important role in establishing alignment of these, or at least refinement of these V1 to SC projections. And interestingly, this is for the aficionados in the crowd, we actually find this really interesting phenotype where we get um, most of the time, or I guess half the time, we see is a sort of single large termination zone. And then an, about another half of the time, we get this sort of splitting effect where you get sort of two or a duplication of the uh, termination zone. And this phenotype is actually strikingly similar to what uh, the Reber lab showed uh, in the FA, Efrin A3 knockdown mice. And so we think maybe there's some sort of crosstalk between NMDA receptors and Efrin signaling um, and sort of a, a convergence of molecular and activity dependent matching in the SC potentially. Um, the next question we wanted to ask is when is this um, uh, NR1 or NMDA receptor function uh, required. And so we started looking earlier in development and asking if we could detect, um, you know, is this really a, a role of NMDA receptors and refinement of these uh, visual cortical projections? 
And so here we, we're looking at P8. Here it's a little bit too early, even in control mice, the, the termination zone of these V1 projections is not very well defined, so we don't see a difference. But as early as P10, um, we are able to detect uh, significant change or enlargement or reduction in re refinement, I guess you could say, in these V1 projections in the ESC. So really it's suggesting that these NR1 or NMDA receptors are playing an important role in the refinement aspect um, uh, in the assay. Okay, so to summarize this first part, what, what we think is that there's this retinal instruction that's happening. We think activity is involved in this, these cholinergic waves, and we think that NMDA receptors are, are involved. And so we developed a new mouse that allows us to do this. We th hopefully, hopefully this will be a good tool for the field to manipulate gene expression in the SC at different times. Um, we uh, show that NMDA receptors expressed by these tau one derived neurons or tau one expressing neurons are required for the establishment of, of visual map alignment in the SC. Uh, and uh, interesting, this interesting phenotype of a subset of these conditional knockouts that exhibit this duplicated termination zone uh, and, and opening up this question of potential crosstalk uh, with FAA slash FRNA signaling during this map alignment um, uh, event. Um, so, uh, so that's the NMDA story. And next I'm gonna tell you a story about um, FMRP uh, and our interest in Fragile X as a, as a model system to give us some insight into how map alignment is happening. So for those that don't know, Fragile X syndrome is a, an X-linked uh, neurodevelopmental disorder. It's actually the most common uh, single gene cause of intellectual disability and autism. It affects, I think, about one in 4,000 boys and one in 6,000 or 8,000 girls, something like that. And it's named Fragile X because if you do a karyotype of the X chromosome, you actually see this sort of condensation event here uh, where it looks like it's, it's very fragile and going to fall off. And this condensation is actually caused uh, by an expansion of these CGG re repeats um, in the uh, FM, FMR1 gene, uh, which stands for Fragile X Mental Retardation Gene. Uh, and so normally there's, there's a few of these repeats and, and you end up making a good transcript and you translate into the FMRP, the active protein. And then you can get this pre-mutation where you have a slight expansion, um, you get some degradation of, of the mRNAs and, and reduced uh, protein or the full mutation is if you have over 200 of these repeats, you basically don't make a stable mRNA. You really hyper condense the, the, the DNA and you basically get no transcription and you get no uh, protein. Uh, and so this gene product, we became interested in this gene product, FMRP, which is an RNA binding protein because of its known role in um, uh, neuronal activity dependent um, processes is specifically synapse stabilization slash elimination and sort of activity induced regulation of mRNA translation that leads to either the insertion or removal of AMPA receptors to, to regulate synaptic scaling at some level. Okay, so uh, a postdoc in the lab at the time was really interested in this and she was um, setting up in the lab the ability to look at neuronal function in the SC. And so what we do is we take an anesthetized mouse, we put it in front of a video screen, and then we sync these, what used to be high density electrodes, but are now uh, laughingly small, uh, 16 channel electrodes into the SC. And then we can record multi-unit activity from these neurons while we present different things on the screen. And then we can isolate individual neurons from this and ask uh, when they fired a spike, what was being shown on the screen. And so we use very simple stimuli because I still feel like I'm a novice at this. Um, and so the first is we flash squares around the screen uh, in different places. And this allows us to really um, build up what we call the, the spatial receptive field of the neuron. So here, for example, this neuron likes it when the squares show up in this region, but doesn't care when the squares show up over here. And the other thing we can do is we present these sort of drifting bars or drifting gradients um, that move in different uh, orientations. We can vary the width, we can vary the speed of them and ask um, how neurons are tuned to them. And this allows us to identify two types of neurons, uh, 
uh, direction selective neurons that prefer movement in one direction, but not the other, or uh, what we call axis selective or orientation selective neurons that prefer an oriented bar, whether or not it's moving in, in one direction or the other. Okay, so armed with these tools, um, Rachel sought out to ask what's going on in the SC of a fragile X uh, mouse. And she gets, she uh, first looking at this spot response found this really striking phenotype where neurons in the SC have an enlarged receptive field. So they're uh, more diffuse and they're responsive to larger regions of visual space. They also seem to be slightly elongated along the, what we call the azimuth axis. So that's the horizontal axis of space. Although it seems like it's not as, um, it doesn't turn into a complete football. It's, it's uh, mostly okay. And in response to the uh, drifting gradients, Rachel found that uh, orientation selectivity, so this ability to respond to things moving both ways seemed to be okay, but direction selectivity was particularly affected. Uh, and then interestingly, she also found that uh, while, she, while we didn't see an increase in, in sort of activity in response to the spot stimulus, neurons in the SC were, were hyper responsive to the, the grading stimulus. And it actually turned out that um, this was specific to these axis selective neurons and not direction selective neurons. Um, so lots of interesting things going on here. The take home message is that fMR1 or loss of fMR1 doesn't lead to a complete sort of uh, disruption of all visual function in the SC, but it rather these sort of specific changes. And so we were next interested in in sort of where the source of this uh, disruption in function might come from. And so this, uh, uh, sorry, I'll go back here. So this uh, enlarged receptive field phenotype was very similar to us to what people had reported in these mice that were lacking these waves of activity that I showed you before. So the mice that are mutant for a subunit of the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, these guys have larger receptive fields that, that are a little bit elongated along the azimuth axis. And as I showed you before, they had disruptions in the organization of retinocollicular projections to the SC. And so we hypothesized that in these fragile X mice, the retinocollicular projection was probably disrupted because fMRP is involved in these activity dependent stabilization and it's expressed everywhere all the time <laughs> in the brain. To our surprise, however, when we traced projections in mature uh, fragile X mice, we saw no difference in the topography or size of these retinocollicular terminations, uh, which was, this is one of those moments where, where you're actually very surprised by a result and you don't kind of believe it. So you repeat it over and over and you're like, okay, that's, that's real. Uh, so we, we said, okay, well, there's no disruption in these retinocollicular projections. Uh, obviously the next source is, is these V1 projections, so let's trace those neurons. And uh, strikingly, we see this uh, significant increase in the termination size of V1 projections to the SC in these fragile X mice, almost to the same degree that we see this increase in receptive field size. So really supporting the idea that it's this expansion in V1 territory that, that may be driving the, the functional phenotype, although we can't really show that. Um, we were curious maybe if, if this uh, was not necessarily a failure of refinement in the SC, but rather a disruption of the organization of inputs along the retinogeniculocortical pathway. And so we traced those projections as well, and we did not see any change in the, the fragile X mice in these sort of projections. So here tracing forward from the I to the LGN and backwards from V1 to the, the LGN. We don't see a lot of uh, change there. Okay, so uh, this was a really uh, fun story. The next question we had in the, the lab was sort of, when does this uh, phenotype uh, present itself? And we actually got some surprising uh, data on that. So a postdoc in the lab, um, uh, Rachel Kay, I'll just skip through this in the interest of time, uh, wanted to ask, how do these V1 neurons sort of refine in the SC? And we can just focus on this plot here. What we see is that during development, we actually see a normal refinement of these fragile X, uh, of, of V1 neurons, V1 SC projecting neurons in the fragile X mice. But then we actually extended our time course and found that as time goes on, we sort of see this increase in uh, 
uh, res or, sorry, termination zone size as time goes on in these fragile X mice. So really suggesting that these uh, fragile X is not so much important for the initial alignment or uh, refinement and establishment of alignment in the SC, but rather either the consolidation of that or the maintenance of that uh, alignment as time goes on. And so we're actively doing experiments where we're trying to ask when FMRP is, is required by knocking it out, taking advantage of this tal tal one cre tool to knock it out at different points in development and see um, whether or not it's required. Okay, so uh, here I've shown you that we um, uncovered subcortical uh, visual structure defects in fragile X mice. Um, as I mentioned, the, the SC is really important for regulating head and eye movements. So uh, we wondered if there might be a relationship between this disruption that we uncovered here and the known disruption in eye movements uh, associated with fragile X syndrome. Um, uh, and interestingly, we see these sub-circuit specific deficits, which I didn't really get into a, a lot here. Uh, and previously, uh, the, the Portera, uh, Caillou Portera lab, um, revealed that in V1, actually, they see a decrease in orientation selectivity uh, in the in V1. And so we wonder if maybe the defects in V1 are being relayed uh, to the SC as well in these uh, fragile X mice. And then finally, this really interesting uh, result, which is which is pretty new that we're starting to, to hunt down, which is that we have this failure to maintain visual map alignment in the SC of these fragile X mice. And we think that maybe this might be driven by visual experience. So uh, studies from the Constantine Patton Lab a few, several years ago now showed that uh, in the SC, there's actually this sort of maturation event that happens uh, when the eyes open. And if you keep the eyes closed, this sort of doesn't occur. And they showed similar defects specifically in these V1 uh, projecting neurons, their arborizations are sort of screwed up if you keep the eyes closed. And so our hypothesis now is that FMRP might be playing a critical role in this either consolidation event or in uh, the, the maintenance of visual map alignment. And so we're, we're actively getting at that. Okay, so to, to summarize everything, um, uh, the development of visual circuitry in the SC goes through a few different phases, this is our, sort of our working model. And so, so the first step is RGC mapping. And these, these retinal ganglion cells come in and over the first postnatal week sort of refine and is establish topography. Following that, these V1 neurons come in, they go through a similar process of uh, branching, refinement, and, and establish alignment uh, in the SC. And then what we think now in, in, in combination with the uh, Constantine, Constantine Patton Lab work is that there's a uh, active activity dependent events that consolidate this alignment and maintain it over time. And so um, activity we think plays an important role in all of these different processes, but we think that how activity regulates them might be different at each stage. So that is to say, we know a lot about RGC mapping. Uh, people have done tons of studies and show that there's like this heavy and like spike timing dependent plasticity that happens there. It seems to be NMDA receptor dependent uh, and it is FMR1 independent as we showed. In contrast, visual map alignment, we don't know a lot about what the plasticity mechanism is. Um, I showed you data today that suggests that it is also NMDA dependent and it seems like it's FMR1 independent here. Whereas uh, after the eyes open, you have this evoked activity and it seems like there's more plasticity in the system than maybe we thought previously. We haven't probed the role of NMDA receptors um, sort of in this, this process. They could be involved, but we, our, our preliminary data really strongly suggests that this stage is at least um, FMR1 dependent. And so we're sort of actively trying to figure out um, if, if there are different ways in which activity is invoking um, different molecular pathways or signaling pathways at these different stages um, during development. Okay, so that's all I had today. I wanna to thank um, the folks in my lab that did the work. So um, Christy was a, a graduate student in the lab. She did all of the NMDA receptor um, studies. She graduated last year uh, and has moved on to brighter pastures. Uh, 
And then Rachel, uh, Nicole, and Ashley were all talented postdocs in the lab did, that did a lot of the Fragile X work. Uh, and of course, thank you to all of the funding sources that have allowed us to, to do this work. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much.